Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, maybe uh, wherever you are. Uh, hello, and um, thank you very much for joining us in this uh, webinar session. Uh, another one organized by the Employment Law Department of Cuatro Casas. First of all, uh, let me just hope uh, that you, your families and friends are fine. <clears throat> Um, my colleague uh, Jaime Pavia and I uh, will be presenting the highlights of the most recent regulations in Spain with respect to employment, labor and social security law and the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, please consider that uh, should you have any questions, queries or comments whatsoever after this webinar, you may just send us an, an email at the address uh, that you will uh, see in the, in this, in the following uh, slide. Um, which is, uh, uh, you'll see it here, yes, webinars, uh, dot quatre casa, uh, webinars at quatrecasas.com. Uh, and we'll be pleased to just uh, respond and, and, and set a date uh, to speak. Um, so in order to provide you with an overview of uh, of the most uh, recent regulations in Spain, it's crucial to first uh, uh, consider where we are. Uh, as you may all be aware, and with the advance of the COVID-19 in Spain, the Spanish uh, Prime Minister declared the state of alarm in, in March 14, uh, by which it not only restricted uh, people's mobility, but also and extensively the economic activity in the country. Uh, at this moment, we are currently in the so-called transition plan uh, to a new normality, which entails slowly and partially dismantling the lockdown in different phases. So uh, we have some parts of Spain that have already moved from uh, the so-called phase zero to phase one, but there are still some other parts, uh, which in fact are the most populated ones with Madrid and Barcelona among them, that are still in, in phase zero. Having said that, uh, we'll be mainly covering the content of the recently published Royal Decree Law 18-2020, which was passed last week, and uh, which, by the way, is the result of an agreement uh, reached by the main unions, the employers' organizations, and the Spanish uh, government. Uh, nonetheless, please uh, note that there are some other relevant uh, measures that have been uh, enacted in the, in the last weeks and that we won't be covering in this uh, session, but which have been covered uh, uh, in, in previous sessions, uh, which, in fact, play a key role for international and multinational companies that have either branches or subsidiaries in, in Spain. Um, just a, a quick note for you uh, with respect to the relevance of remote working. Uh, this was provided as a preferential measure in the beginning to avoid uh, health procedures, and now it's still preferential and plays a key role in the safe resumption of activity uh, for companies. So it's almost now an employment risk uh, prevention measure, and companies thinking about uh, returning their workforce to, to the premises uh, with the advance of the transition plan should uh, basically think this, this twice. But in any case, um, this regulation I'm, I'm referring to uh, aims at facilitating a, a swift and smooth recovery of uh, economic activity in Spain. And for that, uh, the measures established by the Spanish government are basically three. Excuse me, Jaime, if you can just uh, move back. Yes, thank you very much. So you'll see you'll see them uh, outlined here. Uh, the first set of measures is basically an extension of the duration of ERTE's based on force majeure. Let me just remind you that by ERTE we refer to uh, temporary layoff procedures uh, and together with this extension there has been a, a new and clear distinction between total ERTEs and partial ERTEs that I, I'll, I'll be treating in, in a minute. The second set of measures include certain benefits and limitations deriving from the use of the ERTE measure which will uh, basically be covered by, by my colleague Jaime. And uh, the third measure is in fact, uh, um, we have uh, in fact uh, distinguished it uh, as, a, as a third and different one, 
because its relevance uh, for us makes it, uh, makes it important to uh, treat it individually. And we are referring to the adjustments to the safeguard of employment. As you may recall, a consequence of undertaking an ERTE based on force majeure was a commitment to preserve the level of employment for six months after the activity's resumption. And while this is still the case and it's still applicable, uh, some relevant adjustments have been provided and we believe that this may be of, of, of great interest for you. Okay, <clears throat> I'll start with the first group of measures I was referring to. As I said, this newly published regulation aims at facilitating and allowing companies to benefit from a swift and smooth resumption of activity. And for that, uh, the first thing uh, this regulation provides, it's an extension of the potential effects of ERTES based on force majeure until June 30, 2020. So until the publication of this regulation, the duration of ERTES based on force majeure was directly linked to the duration of the state of alarm. Now this link does not exist anymore. And therefore, and even if the state of alarm is not extended again, the regulation expressly states that the ERTES duration may be extended until at least June 30, 2020. And I say at least because uh, as, as Jaime will be probably covering um, in the next minutes, uh, the government has expressly introduced in the regulation that uh, this ERTES based on force majeure may be extended once again. So it is possible that in the following weeks, uh, this is the case, at least for some, for some sectors of activity. In addition to this, and for purposes of allowing a smooth transition to the business activity, ERTES based on force majeure may from now on be distinguished uh, um, from um, total ERTES or partial ERTES. And this will basically depend on the actual capacity uh, of every company to resume its activity. So if a company may not resume its activity, even if partially because of force majeure, um, that is to say that the government has not lifted yet the, the restrictions to its uh, activity, this company may be confident that the ERTE based on force majeure it has in place will remain effective until June 30. On the contrary, if a company may resume its activity, even if only partially, this regulation provides for the possibility of having the ERTE partially effective. And to that effect, and as Jaime will, will explain, the, the regulation has provided for some exonerations in social security contributions, even for employees who return to work in order to actually promote the resumption of, of activity. With regards to partial ERTES, it's relevant to note as well that this regulation has established a preference for working time reductions. What does this mean? Um, this means that uh, if a company is on, on ERTE and has all of its workforce in suspension, it's preferred by the legislator to have 100% of them working part-time than having 50% of them working just full-time. Okay. And last, uh, consider that they, there may be uh, variations during the ERTE as per employees being affected. So basically, employment contracts that may be activated and deactivated during the ERTE. And for that, there is a proceeding that shall be, that shall be followed, which basically uh, consists in informing the social security in charge of, of unemployment benefits, but also Mm, take into account that not only the activation uh, is uh, permitted, but also and expressly uh, companies may totally or partially waive the procedure. The distinction between these two concepts is that activations and deactivations are temporary, while waivers are a permanent move. And for these, for these permanent moves, a different procedure shall be followed, which requires a higher degree of, of transparency and informing also the, the labor authority. Um, moving to ERTES based on business related grounds, um, please take into account that no major changes have been uh, established in this, in this regulation in regards to, to this kind of ERTES. Just remember that these procedures are foreseen for companies that are suffering the impact of the COVID-19 from an economic or productive uh, perspective. So uh, while the force majeure is directly linked to a government decision of suspending an economic activity, there may be companies that while still active, uh, they are suffering and this, uh, and this may be shown in their, in their account, in their annual accounts or in, in their PNL. 
directly. Or it may be even the case that a company that is currently shut without any activity whatsoever and its workforce in, in suspension foresees that uh, it may not resume its activity even by June 30, 2020. So they are, uh, I mean, the ERTE based on business related grounds is available also for this kind of, of situations. Please uh, remember that <clears throat> this is a different procedure. While uh, the ERTE based on force majeure uh, requires a, a formal request uh, before the um, corresponding labor authority, uh, the ERTE based on, on business related grounds is a different procedure which involves negotiation with the employees representatives or even the unions and which entails a, a relevant effort for companies on, on providing information. This new regulation basically establishes two main, que two main questions which come to, to clarify uh, the situation and provide some sort of, of security to companies, I would say. So on the, on the one hand, it expressly states that uh, the negotiation process uh, may start while an ERTE based on force majeure is still effective. While this was actually, in fact, our understanding as lawyers, it's true that uh, in practice, we've come across with some uh, unions denying such possibility and thus not sitting at the table, alleging that this was not possible as uh, there was an ongoing in the in the company from now on and since this is uh, this has been expressly provided in the regulation it's clear that both sides of the negotiation should should sit at the table and actually negotiate aiming at, at uh, reaching an agreement and on the other hand uh, this regulation provides that companies may choose start uh, starting negotiations uh, later than June 30 and nonetheless have the ERTE based on business related reasons effective retroactively so since the end of the ERTE based on force majeure. Basically, and in this in this respect, this regulation comes to avoid uh, companies rushing into into agreements and allows for uh, better prepare, preparation. Uh, if you can just move on to the next slide, please. Jaime, thank you. Uh, as part of the second set of measures I referred to in the beginning, uh, the first one we wanted to share with you refers to, to this, to extraordinary unemployment benefits. As you may recall, the Spanish government established from the very beginning of, of the crisis that employees affected by, by ERTE procedures deriving from COVID-19 would be entitled to extraordinary unemployment benefits and they are extraordinary because employees do not need uh, to fulfill the ordinary requirements for unemployment benefits and for example there is no need to show a minimum prior period of social security contributions and while in ERTE it's considered that they are not consuming their legal entitlement for unemployment benefits so uh, in case they are uh, actually dismissed in the future they will be entitled to unemployment benefits as if they had not been receiving them during, during the ERTE. In coherence with the, with the extension of the duration of, the, of ERTEs based on force majeure, uh, these extraordinary unemployment benefits have also been extended until June 30. And this is the case uh, both for employees uh, affected by ERTEs uh, based on force majeure, uh, but also for employees affected by ERTEs based on business related grounds. A relevant exception has been made with regards to permanent seasonal employees, which we call in Spain fijos discontinuos, which basically uh, work during part of the year and remain unemployed another part of the year. This is the case for um, employees who work in, in, for example, in sectors uh, that are um, seasonal, uh, such as tourism, for example. Uh, for purposes of actually providing some sort of, of protection to these employees, their extraordinary unemployment benefits will be extended until December 31st. Um, and now I, I leave the floor to, to Jaime. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And good afternoon, every, everyone. Thank you for, for joining our webinar today. As has uh, Elizabeth Jacks explained, in my case, I'm gonna go through the extension on social security uh, contribution that has been introduced by the Spanish government uh, last week. According to what uh, Elizabeth has explained, 
uh, these uh, measures has been introduced in, or in order to foster the return to the, to the activity. So uh, we have to follow that distinction that had been made regarding the total RT and the partial RT based on force measure. Because as you may recall, the exemption on social security contributions are only applicable for those RT based on force measure. For those companies that can remain in, 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 in RT based on total force majeure, the exemption will remain the same. That means 100% for May 2020 and June 2020 for those companies with less than 50 employees as of February 29, 2020, and 75% uh, of those employer social contributions for those companies with more than 50 employees as of February 29, 2020. But the important distinction or the important point that had been introduced is for those companies that have has to uh, resume their activities. So in order to foster that return to the activities, the Spanish government had introduced also social security contribution exemption for those employees who has returned to work. Actually, as you can see from the, from the slide, um, uh, the exemption will depend on the number of employees affected on the, on, on the month that the exemption will be, will be applicable and, and whether the employee is on, uh, if, if their contract is still suspended or uh, he has not returned or he has returned to work. And you can see I'm, I'm, I'm going quickly over it because uh, you, you can see the figures in, 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 in the slide. Uh, for companies with more than uh, 50 employees, the exemption will be 60% for uh, May 2020 and 40% for June 2020 for those employees who have returned to work. And uh, um, for those employees whose contract is still suspended, the contribution, the exemption to the social security contribution will be 45% for May 2020. And June, uh, for June 2020, the exemption will be 30%. As you can see, uh, the exemption is, is, is higher for those employees who have returned to, to work. So the, the, the aim is actually to foster the, the return to the activity. To apply this exemption, the company will have to notify the general treasurer of the social security and the, and the social security will apply those exemption according to what the, the company has notified. And another important issue, another important point is that even though we apply that, that exemptions, the, the contribution will be considered as, as fully made for all purposes. So, so that means that employee will be entitled to the same protection as, they, as uh, the social security contribution would have made in full. Two important, um, another two important points that have been introduced and that I want to talk to you about are the restrictions that had been introduced last week in, on top of the ones that they will um, on, uh, enforce. The first ones is regarding companies with tax domicile in a tax, in a tax haven. Those companies who has a tax domicile in a tax haven would not be able to apply the extension on their force major that my colleague uh, Elizabeth has just, uh, just explained. And for those companies with more than 50 employees as of February 29, 2020, and that want to distribute dividends, dividends accrued in the year that the ERTE has been applied, usually 2020, will have to refund the exemption apply over the social security contributions if they, uh, if they want to distribute their dividends. In case of lack of distribution of dividends, then um, the right to separate uh, by, the, by the shareholders will not be taken into account. Another important point is that the, um, the restrictions that, uh, as I have said, that were enforced, uh, are, are continuous and uh, is, uh, they continue until June 30, 2020. Uh, the prohibition to dismiss because of the coronavirus crisis stands. That means that any dismissal carried out within this period until June 30, 2020 will be presumed to be coronavirus related. 
so that means that such dismissal will be a presumed to be considered uh, to be qualified as unjustified. So the severance payment will have to be paid. But it doesn't mean that it's completely forbidden to dismiss during this period to the extent as long as we can evidence that their dismissal dismiss is completely unrelated to the coronavirus, it will be possible to proceed with such dismissals. The suspension on the agreed term of temporary contract also stands at least until June 30, 2020. So that means that if we proceed with the termination of any temporary contract with an agreed term, such termination will be also qualified in the most of the cases as uh, unjustified and the severance payment will have to be paid for that qualification. Now, my colleague Elizabeth is going to go through the safeguard of employment commitment that also continues and starts in force, as uh, she has explained before. Okay, thank you, Jaime. So, uh, together with the prohibition to dismiss employees uh, based on COVID-19 that uh, Jaime just uh, um, explained, we need to refer to the safeguard of employment, which um, it's relevant to know that initially it was enacted in very broad terms, which led us as lawyers to consider that the law was actually prohibiting any kind of termination of employment if a company had implemented an ERTE whatever kind, and this uh, would be the case for uh, six months after the activities resumptions. So now the regulation has come to define more clearly the scope of such limitation to terminate employment. And uh, it seems that at least uh, <clears throat> uh, there are some reasons to be, uh, to be um, uh, more secure uh, in terms of, of, of actions that may be uh, uh, undertaken in the future. So first, it's clear, it's clear now that this applies only to companies that have implemented an ERTE based on force majeure and additionally that have actually requested for exemptions on employer social security contributions. So this means that there are two requirements that need to be fulfilled. Therefore, and in principle, companies that have not requested for such exemption or companies that may be on ERTE, but this ERTE is based on business related grounds, are left out of this safeguard of employment. Okay. Second, the relevant period of six months during which terminations are prohibited starts on the date of effective reincorporation of the employee to, to the activity, which may be total or partial. This means that uh, there may be more uh, than one initial date of periods of six months, depending on when the activity is actually resumed uh, by each employee. And this may be understood to happen not only when an employee fully returns, but also in case an employee in suspension retur returns to work partially in a reduction of, of working time. Um, third, a company will be considered to have breached its obligation only if the relevant uh, termination affects an employee that was actually and individually affected by the ERTE measure. So it's not only that, uh, um, that the company uh, where such termination takes place uh, uh, has actually implemented a, an ERTE based on force majeure, but it needs to be uh, that an, the termination uh, is uh, affecting an, uh, an employee that was also affected uh, by the ERTE. Uh, fourth, it's necessary to point out that companies may still terminate employment contracts at some level. So this regulation has uh, um, uh, provided expressly that a company will not be considered to have breached uh, this obligation in case the termination in case uh, the, the termination that concurs in this case is any of the list here in the in this slide. So basically, in case of fair disciplinary dismissal of the employee, resignation by the employee, death, retirement, total disability end of the working period of the fijo discontinuo contract, expiration of the term in case of temporary contracts, and termination of the contract due to the completion of the service or project uh, which was the basis of the, of the contract, or in case it's impossible to complete the service or project which, uh, which was the object of, of the contract. 
uh, a fifth issue that needs to be uh, taken into account. Um, if, you, if you can just move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, breach uh, of the obligation will entail the reimbursement of the amounts corresponding to all exonerations of the social security contributions, plus the corresponding surcharge and late payment in interests. Um, there is a new limitation that has been introduced by this regulation that is uh, of, of, of importance, which is that this commitment to preserve uh, the level of employment will not apply to companies at risk of bankruptcy. And last, uh, the regulation states that this commitment to preserve employment shall be analyzed considering the specific circumstances of different sectors, and in particular with the specialties of companies with a highly variable business or uh, seasonal, seasonal employment. It's not uh, very clear what uh, this will entail, but it's true that it has been expressly stated in the law, and we'll see in the, in the coming weeks uh what this um what this uh, uh really means uh and i leave the floor again to to uh jaime thank you raj elizabeth thank you everyone so just to to sum up what has been introduced by royal De decree law 18 2020 uh, a, a summary of what we have explained myself and, and elizabeth basically the spanish government is 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 trying to foster the business activity recovery for so have introduced a distinction in the ERTES based on force major total and partial and have also extended the possibility to implement an ERTE based on business related reasons up to june 30 2020 following the simplified procedure and uh, in order to 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 encourage companies to resume activities have maintained the unemployment benefits and the exemption on social security based for those earners based on force major. And as I have explained, uh, encouraging um, uh, employees to be returning to, to the activity by setting a higher exemption for those employees. And regarding the restrictions that a company should be aware of, uh, on top of the, um, of the ones that, that, that were already enforced, basically the safeguard of, of employment, the commitment that companies that have or that want to apply the social security contribution exemption that have to commit it. And the prohibition to dismiss and the suspension on the agreed term for temporary contract, the Spanish government has introduced two additional restrictions. For those companies, as I has explained, for those companies with a, a with a tax domicile located in a tax haven and the limitation on the distribution of dividends for those companies with more than 50 employees. This is a quick summary of what the, uh, the, the, the latest uh, modifications or regulations that have been introduced by the Spanish government. Uh, Elizabeth and myself, we hope you have found this webinar interesting. And so you have any questions, comments, as uh, Elizabeth has explained at the beginning of our webinar, please do not hesitate to send us an email to the following uh, uh, email address that you can see in the PowerPoint presentation. And we're very happy to respond to you as soon as we as we can. Thank you very much. And I hope you, your families and relatives stay, stay safe. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.